I, I had no idea that Topic Quest and, and you were involved with Corona Y. Um, so I was delighted to see your email address on the invitation. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're part All of a world. completely unrelated group that's obsessed with uh, debating. Exactly. Uh, we're, to be absolutely honest, uh, we're in pretty much your situation. We told Corona Y, this is what we're doing. We think it's relevant. <laughs> you should look at it. <laughs> and uh, yes, we did give a presentation about our work to Corona Y. And, okay. Um, yes. Got it. And so um, is this all the people who are going to be here today? Artur, I'm Slava, Tyler, I see Marc Antoine. I'm expecting Jack. I'll see if he Well, wonderful. Around. The very nature of how we work is we don't know how many people, people will turn up. Uh -huh. <laughs> we could, we could get five. Actually, we, yes. could get, we could get 25. It's Welcome kind of an optional away. thing. Yeah. Welcome to the chaos that is. And management. And management. And management Fluid and management. Hi, everyone. So maybe uh, we can start from the actual introductions. I'll, I'll just start from uh, a simple one. I'm, I'm the person that started Corona Y and uh, definitely didn't expect it to uh, grow to such extent. But now here, here we are. We're uh, officially formalizing the process of becoming the uh, nonprofit organization. We are an entity now, but in the process of um, proceeding into the 1023 uh, tax exempt, exempt sta status. I'm an AI engineer turned into entrepreneurship. I come from a traditional venture capital background, but currently um, almost 100% focused on figuring out how to bring more impact to the world. And uh, yeah, here we are. Okay, I'm Anton. Uh, I also like top, top five people who joined Corona Y. Uh, within Corona Y, I'm doing, trying to product, bring closer all of the efforts our members are doing to production or at least deployment state in the cloud. Uh, my background, I'm PhD in computer science, but after finishing PhD, I jumped into world of early stage companies and startups. Uh, I was living in the Bay Area for the last couple of years, but just recently moved to San Diego for better weather, at least for this year. Uh, yeah. That's about it. Uh, I suppose okay. I can go next. Um, I'm Jamie Joyce. I'm the founder and executive director of the Society Library. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that creates library databases of arguments and claims from all points of view on complex social and political issues. Um, we've been in operation for about two years. We've developed a very specific methodology for argument and claim extraction, as well as how we organize content in a database. However, um, we recently changed subjects to start mapping COVID content. And um, I reached out to you all the other day because I think that there's probably a lot of redundant work that's being done. And if we all have an interest in creating centralized, easily you know, browsable databases uh, of knowledge and facts and things, then maybe we could work together, combine efforts, or at the very least share data so that we can deliver this content to our respective audiences. So our COVID project is called COVID Convo, and we're mapping the arguments, claims, and evidence from various points of view on emergent COVID-19 questions. And so we've been processing a lot of social argumentation from books and television and social media and podcasts and things, but it seems as though you all have been focused more so on perhaps scholarly works, um, which is great because there's so many of them, but that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you all. I feel like Slava should go next. Okay, so yeah, my name is Slava. Um, I'm from Amsterdam and uh, I work here in Europe on, on research innovation projects. And basically, I'm doing all this strange stuff at Corona Y and uh, a lot of experimental things and, uh, well, knowledge graph, for example, that we are trying mm -hmm. to build and <laughs> other stuff. Um, I'm Tyler. I'm, I joined in pretty early on, on the Corona Y journey, like four, four months, five months ago. Um, I've kind of mostly been interested in the organization side of things. I am not 
a coder or a technic a technical person in to that level. I uh, I I try and deal with mostly like community 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 management stuff, and also trying to understand what the community is doing so I can best help the community as a whole. And also, I'm also part of like communications, and to a certain extent, some of the UX side of things. I suppose it's Mark's turn last. Yes, uh, Marc-Antoine Parrain. I'm, uh, as Jamie knows, working on a representation of debates. Uh, so I've been attracted to what's going on in CoronaY because I, they are doing automated claim extraction to a pretty advanced uh, degree, and I'm curious to see uh, and it, they're also looking, there's a community of scientists working with complex models, and I'm interested in modeling the conversations around those models. Uh, so, yeah, and right now I'm still a bit on the periphery of Corona White, to be honest, but I'm still looking at what's happening because it's relevant. Yeah, I think when it comes to claims extraction, um, the VT team quite a few months ago was doing, uh, they trolled Twitter which is the first time we branched out into like non um, academic space and they trolled Twitter for everything related to COVID, which ended up with gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of tweets. And I think, I don't know if they've, um, if they've done more beyond that, but I'm pretty, pretty sure they're in process of writing a paper. They've written a paper on the methodology behind extracting the information and then um, hydrating it which is what they, they basically took all the information and then reattached all the metadata to make it make sense again. Because before that, it was just tweets with very little context. Um, that's something I understand they were doing, but I don't know if there's any more going on there. Um, I've kind of moved house and moved city over the last month, so I've been a little bit less in the mix than for the previous few months where I was here 50 hours a week. <laughs> I think we can ask Akash. He's on the call. Hey, hi, Slava. Uh, I just joined in, so I don't know the context in which we are talking about. Making just introductions. Yeah, you've uh, pretty much called the end of the introduction cycle, so go for it. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, while I think Tyler just picked up the gist of the, uh, the, uh, the stuff, uh, uh, what we were doing is that uh, at Twitter has... Uh, exposed uh, stream which uh, where they collect all the COVID-19 related, related tweets. Uh, so some of the researchers, they have captured that information and they have uh, kept it. And we have just taken the uh, uh, added our own uh, like a kind of a data processing pipeline where we pick up those uh, info, that information, the tweet information and store it in an elastic cluster. So uh, the my uh, idea about doing it was that we can use this to search for some amount of misinformation that is being spread out. Like if you can search, if anyone, uh, I had shared the uh, link to the dashboard. Let me see if I can do that again. Uh, I'll just place it, uh, just hold on, I'll just check. My while, you, while you search, uh, I'll take the liberty to uh, in <laughs> interject. This, I, I think it's very good to start with the notion that we're all talking about claim extraction and meaning different things. Uh, Jamie is working with human claim extraction, uh, as far as I know, and still the case. Uh, Corona Y has been working with automated claim extraction and some human validation uh, dashboards. But, and actually, I think it will be very interesting to see how to unify the two approaches. But I just wanted to set that context. Yes, thank you. Um, we've, we've tinkered with some argument mining models. Um, however, over time, we've just seen consistently that humans outperform um, in claim and argument extraction. And then I see Jack Park has joined, which I, I didn't know you were going to be on the call, Jack. Um, we were actually speaking on a different platform earlier today. So hello, Jack. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good to see you. I'm not sure I know how I got the invite, but it showed up and I'm here. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's just the way it is. I, I, I literally, I 10 minutes ago looked at my phone and I was like, there's a call? 
and I've been invited and I don't even know what it is. Okay, I'll have a quick quick look at what that is and that's what I'm here for. But then it seems like art is a little bit overwhelmed so I'm trying to make sure that there's someone here to facilitate if nothing else, though I am very unaware of fully what's going on. I'm, just, I'm gra grabbing a gist quite quickly and I'm reading up on, on uh, what this, this society of the library is doing. Um, so where, where are you working towards, um, what's your plan moving forward and where you, where you think there can be a crossover with what we, we're doing? Yeah, I mean, so, so one of the things that I've just been doing is reaching out to different groups, including Kayak, which I saw on your website, you're actually partnering with, partnering with in some capacity. Uh, we're just collecting additional data sets, just seeing if we can save ourselves uh, some time. On the Society Library website, there may or may not, but the project is called COVID Convo. So it's covidconvo.org. And by the end of this month, we're looking to replace that with the actual claim database of content. It's organized into a narrative structure. Um, uh, Mark Antoine is a little bit more familiar with how we structure data. We structure it in this emergent hierarchical format. Um, but regardless, we're looking to publish by the end of this month our first what we call meaningful increment and just providing public information based on our understanding of where there are persistent confusions or persistent disagreements within the public sphere. So our audience is very much for the public. I know that Kayak, or I shouldn't say I know, I've, I've come to believe that Kayak is in the business of informing policymakers and legislators um, by processing large amounts of scholarly content and their answering fundamental questions about the infodemic, um, you know, about reopening states and places around the world, etc. So it seems as though there's a lot of focus from various AI groups on how can we process scholarly content to create databases and tools for people in power. COVID Convo is really about how can we address public confusions, persistent public debates, and deliver communications to the public. So we're digesting a lot of scientific and scholarly and information, but through the language of how it's presented in news and videos and podcasts, because those are kind of the intermediary media assets mm -hmm. that translate yeah. scholarly content to the public. So we process the term, all the 30. Term complex, is the term complex language into more digestible, transferable right. language. It's I'm an educator, so it's all, I work with special needs people mostly. So transferring complex knowledge into simple understanding is one of the things that I've I function quite well in this first well. Um Are you about uh, to say Jamie, something? Jamie, I had a question. Uh, like, because uh, scientific information regarding the disease is changing. Like, yes. Because, yeah, so uh, how, how do you manage that? How, or how do you plan to manage that? Well, so when I say publish in meaningful increment, it just means our, our first iteration of a publication. So everything's time stamped as in, as in like based on this information that we've this looked at at this at, time. Yeah. At this time, yeah, they, these are the conclusions and we'll update it. You know, Wikipedia live updates um, and you can't really tell what the timestamp is. Ours is meaningful increments. So there's like additions to something. And then something that's also really important is just getting across to the public that the information is always changing and that a lot of these things the aren't sciences. decided just because a news yeah. article has declared that one study debunks hydroxychloroquine's effectiveness doesn't mean that's something that's actually proven in the scientific world. So it's really important to like show that in the data and that becomes emergent once you just diversify your sources enough. And so that kind of scientific literacy and scientific process literacy is really important mm -hmm. to get across to the public and just say like, hey, there's like, you know, tens of thousands of articles about these things. There's you know, 30 different treatments that are being considered. Um, this is a really complex conversation to be having and just getting across that complexity is a part of our mission. Just so people aren't, totally. you know, stuck in one point of view and they're like fighting everyone else because they think that one point is true in a very complex yeah. system. Yeah, it's one thing that we've discussed a lot is that complexity is often misunderstood right. and systems systems of interaction and systems of uh, of compounding on each other. It's just, it's so complicated. It's just very hard to hold it all in your head. Like the idea of exponential, exponential growth seems to com completely confound and confuse so many people. It's like, well, there's only nine cases. They're like, yeah, but if it's nine today and 18 tomorrow, and, and if it doubles every day, 18 doesn't sound like a lot, but double it and double it and double it. And, and it quickly gets out of control. But so much, so few people understand this kind of non-linear thinking. And it is definitely something that needs to be about um, refining and making people more clearly understanding this. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 um what's your methods of trying to expand expand your point of view and your message to try and cover as much ground? So because you are kind of talking about debunking in some ways or clarifying 
Right. Um, and what, what's the what's the plan to try and do that other than writing a paper that's right now this oh. is the most relevant information? It's a map. She's writing yeah. a map. Yeah, it's a map. Or writing a map then. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's literally a, 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 a knowledge, a knowledge graph. graph. There's an, a knowledge yeah. graph in visual form. Well, I'll yeah. leave that to Slava to talk about. He does love a knowledge <laughs> graph. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we use a debate map to input stuff into our database and then we can pull that logically structured information and present in various visualizations, really. Um, but we have one in particular that we're, is going to be our first. And, and, it's, and it's entirely human created, human understood. How many people are you work, working on this together with? Good question. We just hired like six more people and then brought on six more volunteers. So I'd have to sit down and embarrassingly count it out, which I'm willing to do. But if someone's willing to talk oh, in the what? meantime... Ballpark it. Just, oh, like twenty people. Like twenty. Like he's like, like is the, a ballpark is fine. You don't need to be like. Yeah. Well, if it, if if you said twenty three and actually is twenty four, I'm gonna have to put you out and right. shoot you for it. It's like that's not how it works. We, you know, being precise is helpful. But yeah, like around twenty upwards. You know, twenty people and well, twenty um, people you, regularly doing it. Some of them employees oh, yeah. and some yep. of them volunteers. Yep. Okay. Um, and are you wanting to scale up the amount of people helping with this problem oh, or, are you more I mean, or are you more interested in trying to scale up the problem by digitizing some of the understanding and the model of the yeah, we, we have a tech which side, which side of that we, we would like more people, more minds really put to it. We have amazing like tech people who like are automating our tools all the time and constantly tinkering with our process to make it more effective. things and what's our our program are now easy to scale we have a program we train people we put them through these processes they're ready to go and it's amazing how quickly people adapt to our form of analysis so getting more people is extremely helpful and it's something that we're able to manage really well but at the same time um, you know I'm always on the lookout for other entities and organizations nonprofit organizations for example who are processing a lot of content too who may have data that they'd just be willing to share that we can process in our own way, but we won't have to go out and get it ourselves essentially. So that's kind of why I reached out. But I, I understand, or I, I believe I understand that um, Corona Y seems to be also a community organization. It's pulling together groups and projects. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, with starting, with, it's been described and uh, used, there's a number of analogies we've been using, but we've been kind of using it as um, a little bit like Arta works for has worked for a long time in um, accelerators like in, cool. incubation incubation in accelerators and we look at um, Corona Y as a an incubator but an incubator for community led projects rather than profit led with with impact is the is the goal the goal to actually solve and contribute to real problems that are actually impactful and meaningful not just um, profitable right that's, that's wonderful. Fair. That's kind of the whole, that's one of the reasons why we still function voluntarily. We're looking at um, um, being a volunteer-led organization with a volunteer. We're, we're, we're entirely volunteer right now. There's no one making any money off of it. And the only money that comes in pays for infrastructure costs. And that's it. But it is something we're trying to build on and we're trying to understand it as we go. I mean, like right early on, we were laughing and joking that it's basically we're, we're flying an airplane while building it, while working out where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> and and that is kind of the 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 process that exists that you need to understand the the dynamics of the problems that exist out there that the interest of what people are turning up with i mean we've got within our network we've got over a thousand people who are who've signed up and offered to help in one form or another so obviously not everyone's active some people have found other projects some people sign up to 20 different projects and find their little niche but we're not um we're not about like claiming people. We're about just trying to empower people to feel like they can have some impact and have some feel like they have a little bit of control. Because obviously, everyone back in March was just overwhelmed. And, yeah. And I've always kind of described it. There's there's two, there's there's not two kind of people in the world, but there's there's two kind of people that really matter in this scenario. There's people who run towards problems, not knowing what they're going to do when they turn up but they run towards it anyway. I mean, Terry Pratchett always described them as witches. They don't have to have the answers, but they are going towards the problem because they know going towards it is going to, they're going to have to turn up and do something. Mm -hmm. And we've, we have managed to create an environment where a lot of people with that personality have turned up and we're just trying to work out how we can better you best utilize them, best um, focus them into problems and also um, 
empower them to sort of celebrate the, the value that they're bringing as well. And it is something That's we're trying wonderful. to understand how to, how to better do it, how to look at um, using this network of, of super talented, super intelligent, super interesting people. Like I have never been more surrounded by brilliant, caring people in my life. And I work in schools, so like they're full of, full of caring, brilliant people, but it's the whole world of it. It's such a nice space to be in. And it's the more and more we find more contacts like you, more organizations. And, the, and it, it makes me hopeful that there are so many organizations and small groups, small groups of people making a difference, trying to step up. And it is about just trying to coalesce all them different groups and different people all over. And yet like, in making it efficient so yeah rather than doing two one thing twice one person's worked out to solve right. a problem we've, we've solved this problem here have our solution it don't have to be perfect for you but it's something we've made something we can solve that so um so if you're looking for data specifically slava's dataverse um built on harvard dataverse is chock full of data i don't know how much <laughs> okay. it's absolutely Shop for the data. It's structured data. <laughs> yes, very much. Uh, you know, uh, Jamie, I hear you say, oh, uh, it would be great to have more data. But what I hear is we have two knowledge graphs here. You have a knowledge graph, Slava has a knowledge graph, and it would be very interesting to do a kind of symmetric, uh, you know, merging and symmetric difference yeah. and see what's, uh, what each knowledge graph has that the other hasn't. And there's definitely something to be done in that. But, but, but our knowledge graph is a little is a little bit specific because it was built from a bibliographic point of view. It's not mm -hmm. really like COVID-19, like uh, in traditional opinions, <laughs> in traditional sense. It's more like um, how we use uh, the standard of Library of Congress called mm -hmm. uh, Frame, if you know what I mean. So uh, we are trying to get everything in. in uh, link data and create a knowledge graph that can be actually connected to any knowledge graph which is domain specific. So I don't know about your knowledge graph, what, what actually you, you have. That's a fascinating question. So I do not know about the Library of Congress standard for, for uh, creating knowledge graphs. Is that what that is? You said it's called train? It's called uh, BFrame. I will put in the chat. Okay, thank you. But, but this is the bibliographic information, but there's all oh. the are, aren't you, Slava, aren't you making a knowledge graph out of the, all the claims extracted by the various claim uh, identification libraries like Indra? I, I, I think it's in, I don't know if it exists yet. I mean, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, Slava. It's the goal. I don't know if mm. it's fully been achieved and realized from the different technologies that exist. But so, Slava so, would definitely be. Yes. Yeah, so, so what what actually do, we're trying to uh, integrate all, all data that, uh, other teams actually producing. So we, of course, we have domain specific knowledge graphs, these claims and other stuff. We have um, natural language processing pipeline and uh, it can extract all um, entities in mesh classification, for example. And this information we can integrate in bibliographical knowledge graphs. So basically you, you will get like half of a uh, record field by, by human and half by machine, something like that. And also, we are trying to integrate tools that uh, will allow to do uh, human in a loop. So validation of all information, because obviously, it's difficult to rely on artificial intelligence <laughs> at this point of time. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. kind of combination and uh, our challenge is quite um, well complicated. Uh, because uh, we need to combine efforts with machine. <laughs> so <laughs> It's going to be really, really interesting process, I would say. <laughs> Got it. Uh, well, just responding to Mark Antoine's question, no, um, we've kind of developed our own ontology, um, which I can explain. Um, so something that actually I, I've explained in depth before, I believe to both Mark and or Mark Antoine and Jack, um, is that our ontology is emerged from the um, nature of claims to point to a fundamental question. And so what that means is like claims exist because someone's trying to prove a point about something. And what we've discovered is when we deconstruct the logic of natural language snippets into their most fundamental base unit claims, what we actually find is that they start aggregating into categories. Into groups, categories. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it starts, and once starts you do that- It's a, a number of questions almost. Exactly. So our, so our ontology is that essentially we process all this data, completely deconstruct it. You know, we have, we understand that there's relevance to specific topics and things. So like the relevance isn't lost in this mass deconstruction. 
um, because we make all claims self-contained when we're doing the analysis process, but we see all of them point to categories which point to other categories, which essentially point to what we call the fundamental questions, which is why is anyone talking about this to begin with? Oh, it's because there's something that is unknown. And so we have this ability to find those unknowns. And so for our COVID combo project, we found about 500 dimensions of conversation that fit under 13 fundamental questions. So, so how that data- fundamental, It's the most fundamental unknowns most people are talking about. Is it like right. what, what, what treatments work? How dangerous yes. is it? How many yes. people will die? Like the really obvious questions. And you know, you, like I said, I'm, I, I probably could have a good go and getting most of them 13 just from being, a, being around the data for long enough now. To, and obviously yeah. having an inquisitive enough, not enough mind to bump into enough people asking these questions. <laughs> it's just, yeah. can you collect them up. So, um, and, and, so basically you've summarized lots and lots of language and lots and lots of discussions into variations of the same half a dozen, well, half a dozen questions or, 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 or things that they're just trying to find out. So like I say, what treatments right. are working? What, how, how much risk am I at? from getting it, you know, these sort of questions. Yeah, and, and, and those questions contain what people would think are other questions, but they're actually relevant to something more fundamental. Yeah. So it actually makes sense to build out, we call them ideological narratives. So there's a question and there's various ideological it's narratives systems, and those It's system thinking. It's system thinking mm -hmm. 101. It, like, yeah, it's the, the, it's the overarching uh, art concept, how it breaks down into similar versions of the same kind of questions. I mean- Oh, Tyler, you've the, got it. This is how my brain works. Um, so uh, we've, we have been, we have kind of discussed some of these same sort of points, but we were looking at more specific questions. Mm -hmm. um, we have got um, a, a piece of technology called the literature review tool, which is all about building uh, a tool for people to be able to ask questions. And they, would, and they would then link to, these are the most relevant things that, that are scientifically related to the questions you are asking. We're aiming at obviously at researchers and um, specialists, not the layman, but we have always been mindful of the fact that this, even though it's aimed at specialists, the technology, once it's built well, will be usable for people who are more likely to be the explainers and the communicators for the people in, our, in the general populace, because you need to be able to find the right information to be a journalist right. to then ex explain the right information it's about finding that right information and making sure that it has some validity some some references and some um weight and it's, it's so it's so like it just goes back to scientific literacy and so many people don't understand the idea that science is an is a constant process it's a dialogue it's a discussion it's challenging it's questioning it's not even there's, there's very very few things in science that are certainties and they're called laws and there's probably not, well, in science, there's not many of them. And even the laws are still questioned to make sure that right. they still stack up because yes. we, cause we're, it's, it's an interrogation of life and society and systems. And there's nothing, for me, there's nothing more system complicated than the brain. And there's nothing more complicated after that than society is because society is collections of brains. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I it's, a really, it's a really I interesting topic questions. and a really interesting subject. Go for it. So um, I'm wondering about, um, so you're saying uh, about some custom uh, ontology and how it's expressed. Do you have idea for what is the format and uh, if you have like Sparkle endpoint that can, can be, we can also query and uh, we can create links to your ontology? Yeah, so um, I mean, we use a system called Debate Map. Um, it's a typical argument map with extra lovely features. And um, anyone, anyone with permission can tap into the API and pull all of that data. So once the data, you know, I mean, once the data is out there, uh, making no, 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 the no, actual- No, but, but I, I'm not asking about data. Data is something okay. different. I'm asking about ontology. So all these okay. control vocabularies that you are using for uh, research questions. No, 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 no. It's it's not it's not RDF. Uh, I know enough to answer that question. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a data structure, and they have. A... You've just sorry. muted yourself. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, they, there, there, there's a data structure, and there's a way to go to the main questions, as she says. But it's a uh, it's a relationship between objects, right? Am, am I? Okay. So okay, got it. So, so basically how I see it, so now I'm switching from like knowledge graph business to library business. So it's like authority records, right? And uh, we can actually create links to um, both authorities, if you know what I mean. 
Can, can you, you say that again? A bit more? Can you explain that a little bit more for me? I'm not sure I mean that. Okay, so, I, well, well, I will try to go to the basics. So in library yeah, business- I think, I, think you need to, I think you need to remember, Slava, that you are a hyper-specialist in your field. <laughs> and there's a lot of us that are not. Like, I am seriously a nerd in many different ways, but there are only a little bit of everything, and I am not a library scientist. <laughs> so you okay. need to break it down a touch more than, than, than that for me. I will try to simplify the picture, how library works. So basically it has like bibli bibli bibliographic records and authority records. Uh -huh. And authority records uh, can be considered like author or location or affiliation of something. So basically in, in library, what they do, uh, if they're getting new record, they're just uh, filling fields and uh, they're creating links to uh, um, control vocabularies con uh, consisting of uh, authors, places, and uh, something else. So basically, in your case, it means that um, if there is a re record about some publication about COVID-19, so um, you will get a field where you will list all research questions where it can be linked, right? Mm -hmm. And after you can save this record and uh, it will be findable on the web. Right, so this is how library works. And my question, can we actually turn your database into a list of all control vocabularies that can be, uh, can be seen in the uh, library? Good question. Um, so if I'm, if I'm tracking you correctly, um, not all of our data, archival data or extraction data, actually ends up going into the, deba the database. The database that can be queried is our articulation of that data to, for mm -hmm. public consumption. Um, any references the that claims. we use, links, there's, there's claims, there's categories, there's arguments, there's also media, images, memes, podcast links, and there will be references. There will be that, you know, um, uh, that there, there will be references and links and citations to where that mm -hmm. material came from. But something that we also do is we try to diversify the number of sources that we're pulling that information from so we can create generalized categories. Um, okay. So that kind of that kind of anonymizes some of the data. The more specific yep. arguments when people are actually constructing you know, a claim together into an argument, that's like their construction. And if that's not gen generalizable enough, then that'll have a reference or a source or something. All of our data, like the, the mass amounts of spreadsheets where we deconstruct the language of every, you know, news article or whatever, is something we want to have available. However, given how our current tool works, um, we have to hand input all of that stuff. So that would just be too much. So future mm -hmm. iterations of the library, we want to track everything. We want people to be able to go from the map itself down to the references and go to our actual analysis process so they can look at our process and see did we did we conflate the meaning of a particular again, claim. Again, it goes back to um, something that we are very, very um, proudly and strongly advocates of, of transparency within Corona Y, mm -hmm. like radical levels of transparency to the point yeah. where nearly every phone call is, nearly every call is recorded and put on YouTube for anybody who wants to watch it or is interested because um, transparency of our understanding and our assumptions and our thought models and our behavior yes. informs the, it, it goes back to, we're trying to take the black, the, the blackness out of a black box. Yeah. You know, a black I think box, that's fantastic. We don't, we don't understand what, some, you know, like loads of, loads of AI models and things like that exist right now as a black box to most people's ideas. Yes. They throw information in and more information comes out and, it, and they, and the back black box tells me it's useful. And there's some models that explains why it's useful, but I don't fully understand what's going on inside it, but it, it insists it's useful. Whereas you want to be able to take it off and go, no, you, you can go prove an evidence all the way down to as far as you're interested in going to, because it is right. really important to be transparent and clear because you don't want to get accused of bias and yep. manipulation because literally the point of what you are trying to do is to take the bias and manipulation out yeah. of data. So exactly. you don't want to be biased and manipulative, even accidentally, because obviously we all right. have internal biases. We all are also, we all have heuristics and models in his head that are not perfect. I mean, I, who doesn't love a bit of Daniel Kahneman and his uh, heuristics? So we all have simple jumps that we make logically that are actually flawed but we think there yes. are reasonable assumptions to make at the time so if you can break down and um, it sounds i mean what you're doing sounds amazing but it also sounds really clunky it sounds like if you're using spreadsheets and you're at your hand doing it i'm like we can even if we can't do the argument building we could probably help you with storing the data and improving the interface system which sounds a bit because it sounds super clunky 
that well, sounds like a that's instantly a first jump I can go to is like we need to make the the process of doing the we can there's lots of things that can be automated in life and simple tasks that are copy moving they're all you know take yeah. inference and language understanding and complex inference that's still something that ai is working on and obviously with natural linguistic programming and um, natural language nat natural language pro uh, processing and the like it does exist but it's so complicated because the nuances nuances of language it's you've got to infer from five different points of a sentence before you actually know for what a sentence can say and the sentence might be dependent on three other sentences around it and the context of right. It's an argument that's saying positively or negatively that there's so much more complexity to language. Um, but you compare that to, can we just help automate problems so you don't have it to do that? So you can spend more time doing the stuff that we can't work out how to do quite yet for you. I mean, that feels like that's, that's, a, natural, that's a natural bridge for you already there to try and support that part of it. But it depends, on, who we can, it depends on what we can bring on board and um, who we can get on board with this idea. It does strike me that there's, um, we've got programmers and we've got you know developers within the community. Obviously, quite a lot of them are busy in several different places. But it depends on what technologies you guys are using and what you um, feel, um, other than pure data, because you say you need data and that's fine. I mean, we could speak to Akash and the um, the Twitter API system that they've used. I don't know if you guys have been trolling Twitter because they pulled down a lot of data from Twitter and obviously it goes out of data as fast as it Peers. yeah um but that maybe showing or explaining and transferring the models and how they extracted data uh, piles and piles of data and what they did to hydrate and the process behind that that might be a way of getting more conversational understanding especially um what people are thinking online and what people are discussing because it does carry weight to it because obviously there's twitter has got elements of like really great nice bits and obviously like there's academic twitter and there's like there's right. all little there's all little communities in that one big network and and there's there's conspiracy theory nut jobs over here right next to scientists actually doing the work and they don't talk to each other because they don't cross over in the network but they do exist on the same system and right. finding out how yep. to maybe get some of the weight out of that might be interesting but um I'd love to know where, where you're pulling sources from right now. You say you have podcasts, which I'm a big consumer of podcasts. So internet generally, just like how broad a net are you throwing right now? So we have a team of archivists. Um, like I said, we've tinkered with argument mining models and we really haven't found anything that meets our needs much like human beings do. So what we do is we train a bunch of archivists and they're given a sheet. They have a number of different um, media domains in which they pull information from. And they're the curators that are trained to like pull in a, a diverse set of resources from diverse points of view. So we have like guides and sheets as to how to do that. We've got custom search engines to make sure that they're querying certain news organizations across the spectrum. We do have a parameter of US-based content for now. Um, but essentially they're trained to create a representative sample of content and that our extractions go through and they rip out the claims and arguments. Um, and so that comes from television snippets, books, they cite experts, um, news articles, various websites. Um, we actually lost our Twitter Twitter capability. We've got a team who's working on scraping Reddit and other sites, which since this is recording and going on YouTube, I'll, I'll hesitate to. to do that. What's that? So I don't need, need to do that. Uh, so, huh, so what we have felt is that it captures all the Twitter information that is about more than uh, about uh, some millions of tweets in a single day. So that we are capturing and placing it into an easily queryable database. So what your team can Wonderful. do is that if they, and it is completely, I think uh, about 70% of the data is from US space geographies. So you can just query it and ha or look at the current recent trends and then find out okay, okay, whether you want to concentrate on any specific topic. Uh, so Jamie and Mark, what I've done is I've uh, passed out that uh, the link to a dashboard. So if you can click it, there's a dashboard which you can open and it, uh, uh, it should open on your screens and you can have a look at what is there uh, currently. So if it's a first chat on, on, a, on the Zoom group chat. Oh, I see. Thank you. Right at the yeah, top, that, yeah. that would be wonderful. So it strikes me as that's a place we can obviously help. Uh, but with, one, uh, one thing. I had one more question. Uh, sorry, sorry, Tyler. I had uh, one more query on this is that uh, while you are capturing all these, what happens is even if something happens, uh, like if there's some 
uh, news which has uh, take, uh, has been uh, distributed across uh, say a television or a cable they always tweet it on their twitter handles so that so it becomes kind of you can capture information from multiple sources uh, but uh, uh, so what i understand from your discussion is a lot of your process is very uh, manual in a sense you have people archivists who sit and gather the information from multiple sources and then you work on it to create a podcast am i right when i say that that, that is the final output creating a podcast with specific no uh, no they are they're extracting yeah. data from no. podcasts and they they they, they are extracting from data if, from podcasts and then using it okay and and, and, and television and, yeah. and news articles and scholarly articles and websites and other databases and like i mean we use like gdelt we extract stuff from gdelt as well so there's a lot of different media streams that we're pulling in content from and there's many ways in which we archive what those claims are because it's not just like the linguistic claim expressed through language but it's also how does that podcast um, communicate uh, through audio what that claim is and archiving that as well as one of the possible um, expressions of that claim because some people they can hear something and comprehend it a little bit differently than what they're reading it yeah, I'm a very auditory person. Inflection matters a lot. Like I said, I'm, right? I'm into music, music, music technology and music generally and audio and, and podcasts and video are all like, I can sit down and read, but I consume through audio much easier, which is why conversations like this work really well for me, but not for everyone right. else, which is why right. I can accidentally monopolize them. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, the, the other thing that I think people need to be aware of is that one thing Jamie's methodology allows is the, the people often will flag implicit premises, implicit claims mm -hmm. in, the, in the text, which no AI does. To come back to the, to the question of, of uh, Slava, a question to Jamie, when you have a reference to a source in, in debate, uh, debate map, how detailed is that? Is, just, is it just a link or is it something that would be equivalent to the bibliographic structure? And question to Slava, how much uh, in your RDF structures, how much do you model claims? So to see if there's enough data to have the matchup between the two structures. Great question. I'll quickly go first. Um, so in our debate mapping structure, it links to a permanent link in the Internet Archive. Um, in our actual uh, sheets where all of the native claims and the origin data lives, there's, bit, there's like a, an actual citation and enough information to have that citation and an APA styled citation as a but part of that But that would not well. be accessible with the API yet. Right, yet, until we can integrate those things, because we're happy to provide but, the data. But that, is easy, that is easy to automate, however, because if you have the same link in debate graph, uh, debate map, it is there. So we could yep. just match with the Excel. Yep, yep. Good. Slava? Yeah, so before uh, answering your question, I have additional uh, suggestions. So what I see in this uh, debate map um, structure, so probably you, you should also put uh, some links to Wikipedia or I don't know, some, some ontologies. Because for example, if I will go to database and I see there are some uh, things already filled and- uh, What are you looking at? I'm looking at the debate map. Oh, okay, so-, so I went to database, like mortality yeah. rate. Uh, so clearly, uh, if I will click on mortality rate, there is description what it means, and there is type, disambiguation, forms, and what is missing is uh, URI. So preferably, it should be linked to Wikipedia also. Yeah, they're if, not gr they're not grounded entities. Yeah, in but, your but, vocabulary. <laughs> but but this uh, is what also. I mean. So if if you will add uh, URI as optional field for some um, things like mortality rate, you can easily link to uh, well-known ontologies. Okay, so one thing I, I want to clarify really quickly too is, so debatemap.app is a tool. The person who created it is on our team, but a lot of the data that you're looking at, like all of our maps, the Society Library maps, are not yet publicly listed because we pull that data to our front end. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what you're looking at, but the ontologies that you're probably seeing are probably exercises done by interns 
or other people just tinkering with the tool, so it doesn't reflect how we would structure the data. Um, Wikipedia is a fantastic resource for definitions. Um, and then can you put a link to the other ontology you were referring to? Because I'd love to take a look at what you were referring to. But okay. like for, for mortality rates as an example, like we can embed definitions and have multiple dif definitions um, if the word is the same but needs to be disambiguated because of the context. So that's a feature that's possible in this tool and it's really important mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, you can find link in, in Zoom. And uh, answering question from Marc Antoine. So um, this big frame too, it's built on, on top of uh, Mark 21 until, um, standard from Library of Congress. Oh, and I see what you mean. It's very detailed standard. So you can actually put in different fields, you can put any information and you can create links to other databases or to uh, ontologies like, like I already explained. And this is how it can be linked. So basically it means that um, physically we don't need to integrate uh, two databases together. We can just yeah. integrate on, on, on authority uh, level. I mean, but, on, on the level of... But well. there's, no, there's no notion of claim relation. Like for, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with AIF, which is... No, no, uh, no. So, so it's completely domain uh, independent. And uh, those relations sh should, should be actually... Um, so what they did uh, at Library of Congress, they added uh, specific fields to indicate relations. So you, you will just put, so because it's structured data, so you'll put in some fields information um, about uh, entities and in other fields, you can put information about relations between those entities. So you can actually describe relationships uh, inside of one record, just using different fields and uh, different subfields. This is how it works. And uh, if you'll get it in Mark 21, you can, uh, immediately go to, to the knowledge graph because have everything is structured already. Every right. field, it has um, links to other ontologies. So it knows where to map it already. And after you can get it in RDF and uh, query. So if I'm understanding correctly, like given the, the fact that this particular software that we use um, already has that embedded the relationship between entities, even if the entities are categories or claims yep. or arguments or, you know, the, the actual relationship, whether it's, you know, a pro or a con or truth yep. or relevance is something that could be extracted and translated to other ontologies. Exactly. Okay, cool. Okay. So uh, this, is, I... uh, this is really bi bi bibliographical uh, ontology and it's uh, completely domain independent. I'm, I'm a bit. Uh, I just uh, want to, uh, go ahead. I wanted to share my screen. Uh, is it okay? Go for it. It's open, yeah. 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 So uh, I was just looking at the uh, debate map, and this screen is interesting. You can explain what, what is happening out here. Again, any of our maps are not on debate map. So anything that you all can see is not our data. So this, I have no idea who created this map. Um, debate map was an open source tool that was put on the internet. The person who created it is on the society library team, but his tool is also just open for people to participate in various debates. So um, it looks like by the colors, um, there's a couple of different questions coming off of the root node. There are clarifying questions underneath that sub question. It looks like he's incorporated his scoring mechanism here. So based on the number of pro, con, truth, relevance claims, and whether or not there's evidence or counterclaims to those, he has a scoring mechanism that we do not incorporate into any one of our maps. So I didn't expect it to be a show and tell meeting. So I didn't pull up any of our maps, but you can't see anything through the regular debate map website. So, any so, of our so, data. So something that's uh, so not obvious. I guess most of your anthology will be in this kind of a format where you will have a root information and you'll have additional information added up as a anthology in that or uh, some kind of a it, it, yes, 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 but you have to understand that there's a lot that Jamie does that is uh, encoded in her methodology in how right. she uses the tool rather than the tool itself. So mm -hmm. the, the tool does not contain all the information about the methodology is what I'm trying to say. Right. In fact, most of the work actually happens, um, let, like you mentioned, Mark Antoine, through our, through our research process. Um, so the actual structure and ontology uh, is 
created offline essentially. And then we just use this tool to structure information in the database that we then Once pull from and visualize it. differently. If, yeah, so you just use it as a visualization tool after you've collated and created all the understanding for lack of a better word. Right, exactly. So the only thing to take away from debate map, which is its own website and it's a tool that we use and has in many ways been made custom to the society library because Venrix who created it has joined our team and makes custom changes for us and our purposes. The thing to, to know about the tool is that what it does is it creates relationships in terms of categories being associated, but the relationship gets more refined when you're talking about arguments relating to other arguments as in, as in pro or con arguments, arguing about the truth and relevance or specific things. And there's different nodes such as media nodes, image nodes, um, equation nodes, quote nodes, reference nodes. So there's a lot in this package about how to identify entities based on what it is and how it relates to other entities. And the whole tool itself is meant to structure information as if it's a conversation or a debate. So it's not just, I mean, you, you can literally use the tool to be a series of hierarchical categories, in which case there's no adversarial relationship indicated by pieces of information. But this tool specifically was structured for debating. Um, we call it COVID convo, which means we're simulating what an interaction between claims and arguments and ideas could actually look like. Because um, that's kind of the, the purpose of, of how we structure content is how, how if everyone was at the table, and adhering to specific rules of deliberation, could we have a functional conversation to inquire into the truth of any given point of view? And how we structure that in the emergent um, ontology uh, comes from our methodology of breaking down claims into their individual components and seeing what natural hierarchical structure emerges by pointing to the fundamental questions that exist, which is why people are having these conversations in the first place. So we, we break down conversations that people have and then restructure into a more integrated conversation, which is why this tool is so useful. But again, um, any anything that you can see in their open platform was just created by someone. Um, I have no idea That's who fine. was creating yeah. those maps. That's, cool. That's fine. It, but it's, like I said, I've only had a glance at it. I don't very often spend time looking at this stuff while I'm in the middle of these calls. Yeah, but I need to have time to think about stuff afterwards. Um, I don't know if we've got any uh, steps to move forward other than we've had an interesting chat. What are you feeling? we could um, bring to the table or you are wanting, because you, you said you came here like, I need data or we need more data. And it sounds like to me, you've got a process to get data that seems though manual and arduous, robust in its principles. Um, it seems to be that you're grabbing information from as many, many reputable places that conversations exist. You know, the reputability obviously carries weight, but at the same time you, you are, you know, you like say you're looking at Twitter, you're looking at, you know, social media places, you're looking at news articles, you're looking at television news, you're looking at all the media channels that exist, and then you're collating them and, and compressing them. Um, yes. But what, are you, but what are you wanting to do? Or what, where can we help? Where do you Sorry, feel we you. could help? Where do you think so, feel we could help? Thank you for your question, Tyler. So the reason why I reached out is if you have structured data about scholarly articles or otherwise, if we can query the Twitter, the Elasticsearch tw Twitter database, that'd be fantastic because we lost our Twitter capabilities. Um, so that would be wonderful. Um, also, if you know of any programmers in your network that'd be interested in jumping on and perhaps writing a quick tool to integrate our collection, our mass collection of, you know, CVS files and spreadsheets that contain all of the origin data that could be accessible to our front end interface, that would be fantastic. Or anyone who's interested in contributing more to the automation of our process, that's wonderful. And I don't know, um, Slava, I wasn't sure where you were at in terms of creating the smart uh, scholarly article database, but being able to even see structured data um, to incorporate into our map um, would be incredibly helpful if it's mm. developed. Um, the database exists um, and it's queryable right now, is it Slava? Yeah. So there is a yeah, all, the, all, all, the, all the all the code nineteen database is queryable. Well, uh, no, not latest version, but yes. So we have RDF in Dataverse, and uh, uh, we have uh, also Sparkle endpoint, so you can query it, and you can get back uh, all uh, triples. And uh, that something is already accessible. We we also have few find so this interface uh, library interface to uh, access uh, all metadata information. So it's also possible to use. 
to find something. Um, when it comes to their data that they're currently using, like say it's all CSVs that are manually made um, in spreadsheets, is there a way we could host and make that more practical to be able to be queryable in a more practical way? Can we automate and speed that process up and then work out? Could, I mean, like, I'm assuming you guys are basically just making spreadsheets that are just, you just yeah. literally, collectively, you're just making spreadsheets and filling, filling cells. Well, yeah. yeah, but I mean, as the, as the text transforms from sheet to sheet, like that's, that's automated. So once we have like our archival sheet that parses out into a bunch of our extraction sheets and those are assigned to certain people and they jump on and do the work and it's organized by topics so that we can then focus on the, the topic domain of the debate. Mm -hmm. But there's, yeah, there's ways to improve it for sure. Uh, it definitely sounds like that. It sounds to me that um, we could, the first place we could probably like the, the quickest wins we could achieve would be automating mundane tasks that are very automatable. And um, that's probably the first first case of trying to work that solution out. Um, we need to try and probably have some crossover conversations and maybe see what you're working on and, and see some of your actual document, you know, the actual spreadsheets, yeah. so we can better analyze how we can understand that. And I don't know if Anton or Slav is going to have time for that. I'm not going to have time this week, but um, if we can well, probably... Basically, basically what we need is just to get all the spreadsheets in Dataverse. And after we yeah, that's kind of that's kind of uh, my thought. Yeah, just exactly if we could just put all of yours, yeah, and it won't uh, take much time. Well, uh, it's kind of well, not really secret stuff, but uh, something new. So I'm I'm working now with other people on a kind of prediction tool that can um, can create links uh, between entities automatically. So it means that uh, if we'll find some mesh entity, we'll be able to recognize automatically uh, the same entity in Wikipedia if it does exist and probably we'll find um, entities in other ontologies. So we, we can- actually, That would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, because we are, how many, how many different ontologies are we pulling from right now that are like respected ontologies? So we got like so, so, Mesh. Yeah, we have Mesh, we have Grid, we have Orchid, uh, well, some medical ontologies. So we have quite something, of course, Wikidata. Yeah, and Wikidata as well. So yeah, yeah so if, I mean, we're already, the tools already exist to integrate that kind of connection. The tools already, <laughs> tools work. Yeah, the tools already exist I, I, I don't work. Have, so, so I even have uh, like secret links uh, deployed on uh, our infrastructure where you can actually um, answer questions and you can create knowledge graph automatically. So That's it's fantastic. implementation of human. Yeah. Probably yeah, I, I can even uh, show in the chat, but not, you know, for public because still we are experimenting, but uh, yeah. it's very promising. Yeah, at the end of the day, Corona Y is trying to build, um, our, our, one of our big goals is to build an, a system that can, a system that can generate knowledge graphs and integrated understanding of any domain, as long as there is ontologies of that domain. So mm -hmm. if we, can, we, we, right now we're mostly concentrating obviously on medic, medical knowledge, but, the idea is we could take the same technological principles and the same infrastructure systems and then go, okay, now focus it at psychology and use the psychology, you know, systems and then basically extract and make things searchable and then go, okay, what can we, can we do the same thing with physics? Can we do the same thing with biology? Can we do the same thing with environmental science? Can, and the idea is to build a tool that can approach any domain as long as that domain has respected open ontologies that we can use as reference points to make them understandable. And then the idea is to integrate all of these domains into a large knowledge graph that talks to each other. That's the, that's the big picture, but it's ridiculous yeah. and absolutely I mean, I think it's, audacious. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's fantastic, albeit audacious. And I mean, we're, we're interested in doing the same because we find patterns to human communication and conversations. We had worked on climate change prior to COVID-19 and found about 220 subtopics of debate that Americans engage in about climate change. And that of course implies like tens of thousands of arguments each, all organized under six persistent questions. And immediately yeah. when we decided to switch to COVID-19, we found a lot of similarities. And so we feel that over time, we're gonna be able to map reliable points of confusion, social problem after social problem. And like having you know established 
ontologies for the sciences is fantastic. It's such it's going to be such a wonderful resource, and I hope you accomplish it because that'd be amazing. And I think that we need to do the same for social communication because a lot Absolutely. of our problems, you know, aren't you know, there's certainly academics argue and maybe um, cause a little bit of trouble, but really what it comes down to um, is you know is is there public buy-in and how quickly it's, we solve social it's problems. Communication. It's mm -hmm. communication. It's really communication. Okay. It all comes down to communication, which is the reason why I consume so many things about how to communicate better, because it's something that I've had to actively learn and put effort into. But communicating right. and explaining things, it's a skill set, and it's a, it's, it's an oft unutilized skill set, and it's rarely given the value it needs to be. Because, I mean, um, Alan Alder talks about this a lot, about, about communicating science. He's got an entire institute about communicating science. Yeah. Um, and it... And it, and it is exactly that. So many people who are exceptionally smart, Slav is a prime example of this exceptionally intelligent mind, which is exceptionally capable within his domain. And he can explain things, but not everyone has got that ability to explain things and break things down. And they get lost in their own curse of knowledge and they can't take things back to their root ideas and the root causes and the understanding and break things down into way, into consumable knowledge bits, bits of knowledge rather than raw data that just confuses and overwhelms people and makes people go oh well there's 20 different ideas and they're not all the same and and some of them agree and some of them i disagree with and i don't know where the value is and who's right and who's wrong and and this is the uh the problem when we yeah it's about trying to make people understand how to how to weigh up the validity of a statement how evidenced it is if the evidence exists like you said if, if there's if 50 different organizations are saying a very similar thing and they're from different sides of the debate and the scientists and the, and the, and, the, and there's lots and lots of different consensus consensus isn't automatically mean it's correct but it means it's more likely to be correct because the weight of all these people but if all if if a thousand people who all agree from the very same say make a statement that sounds the same and it actually turns out that all of that evidence came from one piece of information that they've all just perpetuated then that's a really biased piece of information that there's very little evidence of its truth so it's i love what you're doing i think it's great i'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do and i'm going to definitely i'm going to i'm going to look into it more when i get some time yeah, and like I said, I can I can send you all stuff as well. We've got an explainer video, three minutes, walks you through the actual whole process. And I will say too, I think one of the reasons why it's so important to handcraft and have humans actually curating and organizing this content through the methodology that we use is because I, the social communication mapping needs to come through as like real human communication. It can't just be that we've identified these keywords and we've broken up this way. Like I, I think to begin with, it needs to be handcrafted and optimized for understanding and communication and it has to be Absolutely. very, I think it needs that, that touch, especially in how the language is even constructed and how things are organized. Could it be automated over time? Yes. But I do think the, the handcrafted element of it um, is actually which really is, important at this stage. Which is why I've, which is why at no point have I argued that, oh, well, we just definitely need to get the NL, you know, the NLPS, but especially to just automate everything for you. I'm like, it's right. probably not the answer. <laughs> It's more than anything, I'm, I'm a UX researcher. We need to research the problem more. We don't, I don't understand the problem enough to be able to make that claim. Our only claim I can make is it sounds like you've got some simplistic manual processes that can be sped up and they yeah. could save some time and some effort. I mean, like the literature review tool, the entire purpose of a literature review tool is to exist, is to automate things that are boring researchers do so they can concentrate on doing this, the complicated brain stuff that you need the brain for, that you need the specialist knowledge, then you need the ability to infer that data that a computer can't do. That's something that still can't be done by a computer and we need to work out how to get the boring automatable tasks out of the way so we can get the people concentrate on what they need to do. Oh, I, I, th I think we're way over time by this point, but I, I do want to say there's one thing that I do wish existed that would make our lives so much easier, and that would be a browser plugin where our analysis process would be over. You know, we would essentially highlight the elements that we would typically parse it, out into it does our. It exist already. It's called hypothesis. That's hypothesis, and, yeah. And we, already, have, we have it in our infrastructure. We have that already built. Okay, but it needs, but uh, I think I've looked at Hypothesis. I've looked at a bunch of things and they didn't meet all of our needs. So is one of you the developers of Hypothesis? Um, do we have the developer in the community? 
Uh, well, it's uh, just right. Python application, so we can. It's, add, it's uh, open source. It's, it's not open source. That it's open source, change. so we can we can hack it. I mean, well, I say we, we the collective, because yeah. my <laughs> Python's pretty weak. <laughs> Fair, but I mean that's like uh, you know uh, tweaking a tool like that to meet our specific needs, so we can execute our specific methodology would be a huge accelerator to what it is that we do. Because right now we have to. We take a link and we auto parse it into our sheet and stuff like that. Um, so just to be able to go to a website and never have to export it, but instead just to highlight. But, but and even even that if data. you used even if you used unmodified hypothesis, that's a conversation we should have separately. It's easy to put it into uh, pull it from there into a workflow where you could have your yeah. tools. Uh, autom you know uh, that would be. Uh, optimized for your tools. Uh, it's I consume hypothesis uh, uh, quotes in my system. It's very easy to get them. The API is well done. Wonderful. Well, yeah, we okay. just need more hands on deck because we're a tiny nonprofit and the bulk of our work is really in the analysis. So all of our tech team is completely volunteer. So having more hands on deck there would be a godsend. So if there's people in the network willing to help out, that would be wonderful. Right, I'll have to formulate a reach out and see who we've got available to us and who's not already tied up with a thousand things. Because, you know, like I say, volunteers are the really hard things to get, but they're also volunteers are like so often so giving that they end up giving themselves so they don't uh, they yeah. can't do all the things that they want to do. I am a prime example of someone who oversubscribes for myself and can't can't keep up um, with what I think I should do. Got it. Um, well, so we need Python developers because Python probably well, actually, to do actually we can we we can ask uh, hypothesis team to add something because uh, my boss he he was involved in development of hypothesis long time ago. So we we have well, really good, yeah. Well, thank you, this Slava. Is what, so this, I is can... what, this is what networking <laughs> looks like. This is how right. you build big networks. <laughs> right. So, can I, Slava, can I count on you on making that introduction or request for me? Yeah. So, so I just need to, <laughs> to <Thank> tell them. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that so much. So we, um, we, we need to better understand what you're trying to do, which is why I'll try and put some time aside. Send me, well, have, are, you, are you on um, this, our Slack? Are you on our Slack? I'm not, not on your Slack, no. But if I get an invite, us. I can send you, you Yeah, know. and that way we could just have, we'll, we, we generally run things in channels. I say run things, it's like it's still organized chaos and there's more chaos than organized. But, um, but we kind of have our own little space for various different projects that are ongoing. Um, I think, weirdly enough, would you say, Slava, there's a little bit of crossover with what um, the Edinburgh University team are doing? even though they're doing mostly um, academic sided stuff, they're doing human in the loop AI extraction yeah, of data. For, for us, it's not a problem because uh, only one thing we need to get from, from them actually is ontology linkage. That's it. And then we can just pull it, and then we can just pull it, and then we can just pull it all into Dataverse and start running our tools at it. And yeah, can, yeah, yeah. And then, we'll spend, then oh. once we've had a, cl a look at what they're already working with, and we understand your workflow, we can see where we can improve steps and automate mm -hmm. and build, build tool, improve on tools that exist. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's I suppose, that's a next step. I suppose Anton's got something to say because I can see his face. And uh, uh, no. I've, I've just shared a um, screenshot from the tool, so you can get some impression of what we're working on right now. It's just a list of questions that um, artificial intelligence can generate based on, on some data. And answering those questions, it, it can generate, uh, it can predict some ontologies. Okay. Wait, are you going to share something right now? Or are you asking uh, me to share? Shared on, uh, I think it's uh, shared. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, is there's there's a, it is in the chat. Okay, there's a link to, the, yeah, there's a link, screenshot. but there's also a screenshot of the semantic port. Exactly. And what it puts out so it yeah it's how it interprets information yeah I'm, I, f I feel like there's there are ways that ai can help even if it's just for finding things but i obviously don't right. think ai is in even if it's just a case of um if ai can find chunks of things and then humans can then curate and go oh yeah that's definitely correct like that's a lot of what Dakano does doesn't it 
Yeah, no, not only the candle. Actually, <laughs> we, we, we have um, another experiment. We are trying uh, to, um, to to actually to, to teach um, artificial artificial intelligence how to answer COVID nineteen related questions. So you can just ask your question, and you can get answer based on information and data uh, from uh, COVID nineteen collection and from dataverse. I but mean, with course, a bit of luck, if that's if that. It's a question. Is that you're already working on? And then yeah, yeah. So we, I'm, and I'm then, really. And then we, if, <laughs> if we can integrate that very idea with the manually curated system of answering questions. No, no, no. It, it's basically what it does. It's a chatbot that works on knowledge graph. So we, we just need to integrate everything in knowledge graph. And after it can just query and to get information. So it's, well, quite. Uh, Simple concept, but uh, it's difficult to get <laughs> high quality knowledge graph, of course. It's like, it's like everything else. Yeah. It always <laughs> sounds easier than it is to do. Right, yeah. And we, we do have a, um, a chatbot feature that's going to be developed. We already have an interface, COVID Convo, where we've, we've cached the answers to common questions by experts. Mm -hmm. And we've got where people can select a question and it, look, it simulates the researcher with their permission responding back so they can have a limited conversation but then the the goal is to hook up our knowledge graph to a bot to also have that conversation and it we may would, be more hard-coded than ai but you know we, no, we but, would but love in our, in our case uh, because we are, we are dealing with code 19 collection which is uh, continuously updating and also new data coming so the idea just to get all updates automatically so first experts will create uh, well, kind of uh, tra uh, training model, and uh, we will will be able to do it automatically afterwards. Fantastic. So, my 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 query was is the fact that we're already building tools where people can ask questions, and we've already got answers for them. Um, first, can we have a list of your questions you have for that chatbot? Because I'd love to have your curated version of what you think researchers have been asked, mostly just for our research and um, our understanding. And secondly, if you're trying to answer questions and we're already trying to answer questions, can we not try and have one thing ask them both? And then between them, have an informed, this is the human answers, will be human curated, <laughs> and this is the AI answers that are being pulled from all the AI. And if, and if we see mostly the agreeing, then, then it shows that the AI is working and it but, can but be trusted, but it also hopefully we can f feed the AI knowledge into the human curation and then we're into a place where humans can produce a lot more answers and a lot more curation for them time. Basically, Library of Congress already has uh, specific fields that it can indicate that if, it's, if this information is coming from compu computer or human. I believe right. in 833 or something, so it's already reserved and we can use it for this kind of purpose. Okay. So where, where, where are we going next, guys? What are we doing next? When are we talking next? Just well, in the common Slack chat. We do need a common With Slack channel. With both teams, like it's, yeah. yeah. And just start throwing all of this into it. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, I can, d depending upon who a part of my team needs to be tapped for this, um, I can just invite them to a channel in your Slack or it could be vice versa, um, whatever well, you works. Can have, um, well, you, do you, are you using Slack for your coordination or? We are. Well, we can make a shared channel and bridge them. We've got loads of bridge channels with oh. loads of companies. We, I so did not know that was there. No, we, you can make one channel. We've, we've, got, we've got one channel with 10 different Slacks in it. So you can put multiple groups in the same space, but you all perfect. have one channel. So that would be the perfect solution. That way you can throw who you think are interested in it. We can throw who would see would be useful. And then we can have that conversation in that, in that shared space, which makes sense to me. Great. And we'll, so and we'll link this crazy meandering conversation. I say crazy meandering. It's mostly me, so I, I can say it. <laughs> Tyler, things that you've said have been completely in line with things that I believe and I'm excited about. So it's been great to hear That's that to expressed by someone else. <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear. It's, I'm, I'm loving what you're doing. Keep doing it. Uh, and we'll, 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 talk, we'll talk again and see where we can push this. Um, anybody else got any questions or answers before we wrap up? Because we are an hour and a quarter in. Let's wrap okay. it up. Let's wrap it up, guys. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank I just want to say... 
yeah, I just want to say thank you too. And since this is going on YouTube, hello, YouTubers. <laughs> it's mostly um, just our community. We don't get hundreds of thousands of views, don't worry. It's just, it's mostly <laughs> us. I mean, but that's the whole idea is this like- it, is a really good idea. I think it's fantastic, so. It's, it's, a, it's an effective method of, um, of memory as well. So we can go, actually, we had this conversation at this right. point, and this is literally a conversation we had about this problem, or we, we discussed this and it seemed like we didn't like it because of- X reason, and we have it documented. We have it all. Nearly all the all the uh, videos have got like hyperlinks to the times we talk about things. So it's a quick way of getting through. It's not the quickest. Use the conversation that uh, our lawn and plus are not annotated, though. <laughs> they, they get they get unwieldy when I start uh, when I have long conversations. It's it's it's, te it's ten years of streaming, but that's kind of what it does. I can I can talk for eight hours with no trouble at all. So. <laughs> Um, no, everyone's okay, got so, yeah, one. Definitely. Let's, Let's wrap it up. The most important part, like uh, uh, share the Slack channel, the bridge Slack channel. Let's build a bridge. And I'm, I'm an admin on ours, so we'll work out how to connect them too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, well. So we'll, f yeah, we'll send you, yeah, send a link on to, uh, I don't, yeah, we'll send, we'll, we'll link up the two Slacks and we'll make a channel and we'll throw everything together in one space. Slava can look at pulling your data into Dataverse so we can start analyzing what your data looks like so we can better understand it. Um, then you can link the, the, your process, your methods, so we can understand your methods and see where we can improve on them. And then we will go hunting for some people to see if we can bring some more people to bear. Are you wanting more annotators as well or is it specifically just tech to fix problems? Oh, sure. Like if, if people want to volunteer to help process content, we, we have a training program for that. And we've done pretty well with either burning people out immediately so they leave or they're generally interested and they enjoy the process so they stick with us. That and our sounds very similar. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're the hardcore who are still burning or burning on it four months, five months later. Don't get me wrong, I still feel burnt out occasionally. Ar Arthur is burning, <laughs> it, burning himself out. He's burning it, you know, when there's, there's like burning candle at both ends. He's like welded several candles together and he's burning all of them at the same time. I don't know why he's doing it. He's a madman, but um, he's an amazing, crazy human being that burns himself out. Um, so we will pull some links together and we'll discuss it in there. And thank you very much for your time, everybody. Uh, great. All right. Cheers. It was great to see old friends as well. Yeah. yeah. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye -bye. Thanks, Marantan, for setting this up. Cheers. Cheers. It is Jamie's. Enjoy. <laughs>